Um, yeah, so I hope you guys are not sick of the black I.O. storage layer yet. Here, here, he's, uh, here comes another dump of it. Um, my name is Jim Zaxbo. I work for Facebook in the infrastructure team, work on Linux kernel. I've written uh, various things in the Linux kernel, um, like block trace, um, the schedulers that Yan talked about in the previous talk. Um, generally, I maintain the block stack. I have done so for, I guess, about 10 years or more so at this point. Um, so this talk is going to be about solving some of the scalability issues that we ran into uh, with some of the new devices that came out on the market. And in general, uh, if there are questions as we go, please raise your hand. I'll try and answer them. Uh, interactive sessions, I think, are a lot more fun uh, for everybody involved. So um, feel free to heckle and yell and ask questions or save them for the end if you want. So basically, what were some of the issues that we started seeing? Well, um, all of a sudden, when we started getting flash devices, uh, devices went from what I'd say hundreds of IOPS per second, uh, rotating storage, to uh, the, uh, into the category of hundreds of thousands of IOPS, or even millions of IOPS in some cases. And this um, naturally posed some issues. Um, I, I sort of compare this to uh, the development of networking's gone through. They've had 10 megabit and 100 and 1 gigabit and so forth. Um, but they had sort of decades to adapt to the increasing packet rates that they saw in, in the system. Um, for block storage, this was basically an overnight thing. Well, we knew this stuff was coming, um, but it you know, takes a while to gather momentum and get some of these uh, issues fixed up. Um, but it was generally from one day to the other where all of a sudden we had to deal with these devices. To make things even worse, uh, this coincided with you know, processor manufacturers starting to give up on the whole megahertz race and instead throw more cores at the issue and uh, that means that any sort of contention that you have in the stack just becomes you know, much, much worse. Um, not only that, two socket systems became popular. We see systems running four and eight sockets and so forth. Um, so that sort of just exacerbated, exacerbated the whole issue. Um, the existing IO stack has a lot of, of data sharing going on. So when you talk to a block device, um, there are certain elements of the stack or the data that you end up using from, from all the applications that are accessing the device. Um, as, as well as sharing that you see between uh, just one application running on the system, submitting I.O. and the completion events that come in. Um, so these, these uh, made, it, made it a lot worse to handle these uh, very fast IOPS devices. And additionally, I mean, over the years uh, for adapting for rotating storage, we've come up with a lot of optimizations and heuristics centered around making the rotating storage work really fast. Um, back in those days, um, the general consensus was that we could throw a lot of CPU cycles at the problem, since if we just reduce a single seek in, in the system, that would be a huge win. Um, with SSDs and, and no seek penalties and a much faster IOPS, that's uh, you know, no longer the case. So if we look at the old IO stack, um, the one that Deanne talked about in the previous talk mostly, um, we have observed a lot of, of scaling issues. I mean, to the extent where even when you throw more horsepower at the problem, you know, bigger system, for instance, or more applications to attempt to drive the devices harder, you just make the problem worse. So you observe what we call, um, ideally you want, you know, linear scaling as you add applications or, um, or CPUs. Um, flat scaling is bad, negative scaling is even worse, the case where you add more horsepower, but um, you actually get worse performance. Uh, that means wasting a lot of CPU cycles and lots of people, most people don't really like that. Um, you want to get the most out of your system and for people that run lots of systems, um, you want to conserve the power as much as you can. Um, not only was it a, a problem on that front, but it also led to much higher latencies. When you have high contention in the system, you're spending time bouncing cache lines around between applications and or even just spinning on locks to protect um, some shared state in the device. So the question is, well, where was the real scaling bottlenecks hidden in, in the old stack? Um, so here's a, a general overview of, of what the I.O. stack looks like. This is somewhat similar to what Yan um, showed in, in his talk as well. I've bypassed the VFS and, and page cast and that sort of thing. So we focus on the bottom layer of, of uh, the stack. Um, but once you get to the file system, the file system will construct a BIO unit. That's the main unit of I.O. that the file system or any consumer or producer of I.O. will make up and send down to the block layer stack. Once we get into the block layer stack, uh, we set up a struct request, and that's the unit we use inside the, the block layer, and we pass down to the driver and so forth. And that will then either go through the SCSI stack, if you're running on a SCSI system, and then down to the SCSI driver, or it'll go to a request event driver, which is a sort of a, a classic block layer driver, 
Or if you looked at the very right, um, there's also something called bypass mode or bypass driver, which um, bypasses the entire block stack. And that was originally invented for things like RAID, that just take an IO and remap it to another destination, or it may have to split it and send it to you know, multiple destinations if you're doing a RAID one. Um, but as um, some of these bottlenecks started to creep up um, somewhere along in this stack, more and more people adopted the, the bypass mode of driver uh, to be able to write something that would drive the hardware as fast as it could go. And um, that was an issue since uh, we provide a lot of functionality in the block layer, we provide IO scheduling, various helper functions for drivers and whatnot. Once they started bypassing the stack, then they had to reinvent all this functionality. And um, as a maintainer of a storage system, that's not really what you want to see. You want to have as much shared code as possible. You could write it once, uh, make it really nice. Uh, once device driver writers uh, implement something on their own, it's usually not of, of the same uh, quality that we do in, in the general core of the kernel. So if we flip it a little bit and look at it from the application point of view, uh, going through the file system is mostly a parallel thing. If you're accessing different files, uh, generally you don't have any interaction between the applications. Um, going through the, the BIO layer, setting up the BIO is a parallel operation as well. There's no shared state there. Um, but once you get to the block layer and have to insert the request into the queues, um, all of a sudden all these applications end up having to grab the same resources, uh, lock the device, insert these requests into the same shared uh, structures. And the same thing happens after the block layer, we have to pass it to the driver. They're all essentially going through the same um, very tight funnel. So that gives us a good idea of where some of the bottlenecks might be on the scalability front. So in order to test that theory, um, we have set up a test case, basically. Uh, we use a null block device driver. That's something I wrote uh, to help debug some of these issues. Um, to test the scalability and performance of the, uh, of the newer uh, I.O. stack that we'll detail shortly. Uh, Node block is, is a very dumb device driver. You tell it how big you want these disks to be and various other options. Um, and once it receives an I.O., it just completes it immediately. Um, so it doesn't transfer any data at all. So it basically goes as fast as you can. You tell it um, various things that enable it to simulate hardware, basically what IRQ mode you want to use. Do you want to complete it immediately? Do you want to do it through a timer after a small delay? Or do you want to do maybe through a soft IRQ? Uh, and you tell it how big the delay should be and so forth. So for this test case, we run it in Q mode one, which is request of end mode. That'd be the one we have in the middle here. So we go through the bio layer, block layer, and then directly down to the driver. So not SCSI mode, not bypass mode. And we use FIO to drive uh, traffic on it. So for this test case, uh, we start with one thread, and then we just keep adding threads um, to the system to see how performance changes with the threads added. So this particular system had two NUMA nodes, uh, two socket system, 32 threads in it. And for each of the threads that we add, we start off with one thread on node uh, zero, then we add one on node one, and then we just keep piling them on. So basically alternate between the nodes in the system. And this is what we get. Um, so the initial performance of one thread, you, uh, around, I would say, 260K IOPS. Uh, we can see adding one more thread in the system basically gives us slower performance. Um, and the reason for that being is that now we're running on both of the NUMA nodes. So instead of, even though we throw more power at the, at the, at the problem, more applications, now we're throwing things between the two sockets in the system, and that slows things down. As we add more threads, um, we get a slightly better performance. We hover at around 310K IOPS, um, but we don't see any sort of scaling that we would hope that it would just go like this and we'd get better performance. So I ran some profiles to see, all right, so what's, what's the actual issue here? So this is using perf, the profiling tools that, uh, that comes with the kernel. And uh, we see on the, the top graph is just a general uh, um, picture of where we're spending the CPU time in the system here. So we can see we're using a, uh, spending a lot of time doing spin locking. Essentially, 75% of the time that the application run, it was hammering on the lock on the particular device in question. Um, FIO is reporting that we're spending 95% of the time in the kernel, and uh, a good chunk of the total time is just spinning on the lock. If, if we look at the bottom picture, um, that exposes the call graphs a little bit, and uh, we can see that the, the top 37%, these are basically contention between the application queuing the I.O., block queue BIO, and the driver attempting to pull the, 
the request out of the out of the block IO stack and complete it. And uh, we have com uh, about 20% spent from the end IO context. So that means that's contention coming from completing the IO and the submission of it. And 18% uh, miscellaneous uh, from the, the flushing of the block list, basically sending um, uh, the IO from the application and down to the, the block layer. So that doesn't look very good. 75% uh, of the total time being spent just spinning on a lock is uh, time completely thrown away and wasted. So this is essentially what ends up happening. All the applications uh, touching the same queue, uh, uh, adding IO to it, and uh, having to grab the lock to add the IO and do the same thing on the completion front as well. So we have a lot of shared state, and uh, that's completely the opposite of what we want to see. So the assumption right now is that we have good scalability until we reach the block layer. At least looking the, at the profiles, um, it would seem that that's where we, we get all the contention. Um, as mentioned, a bypass mode driver could solve the problem, um, but we need a real future-proof solution. We need something uh, to update the I.O. stack so that we're able to um, give device driver writers a good framework with all the uh, library and helper functionality that they need, but still get the performance that they crave. Um, before the, we attempted to start solve these problems, we got uh, driver submissions from various vendors of flash devices, and they all opted in for the, uh, the bypass mode solution. And uh, it, was, it was hard to say no to merging these drivers at that point because that was the only real alternative they had. If we told them to do a classic uh, block device driver using the request of end model, uh, performance just sucked. They didn't see scaling, and they didn't get the performance they needed. Uh, remember that from the previous graphs, we maxed out around 300K, and some of the devices coming on this time could do more than that. And most manufacturers don't like to have their 500,000 IOP device being limited you know, to half of that performance because of, of limitations in the, um, in the IO stack. So it was clear that we needed to do something about this and uh, come up with a new uh, model. So this is where block multi-queue uh, comes into the picture. Basically, it shares the name with um, similar functionality in the networking stack. Um, networking had a you know, huge head start in, in attacking some of these uh, packet rates issues. Um, so it was only logical that they um, you know, came up with, a, I think, an elegant solution for this uh, initially. There's been, I think historically, there's a lot of similarities between how networking and storage handle um, operations, big IOPS or network packets. And there's been um, code and ideas shared back and forth, um, mostly, I think, from networking to box storage. But we've also, I think, invented a couple of primitives that they ended up using in the networking stack. So the basic idea is, is let's get rid of some of this shared state. Uh, we need to have applications accessing a single device, being able to run in parallel and not step on each other's toes. And we want the completions to happen in parallel with the submissions so that we don't have any cross-pollination of, of cache lines between uh, these uh, events as well. Uh, another criteria was to want to, excuse me, improve scaling on non-multi-queue hardware. Um, some of the devices coming out did support multiple queues. Uh, essentially, may I just explain what multiple queues is. Basically, it's, it's the hardware exposing. Um, usually, you have a ring or some sort of interface on the hardware. You place events that has to be processed. Um, if you have multiple of these rings, so you can submit things in parallel, these is what we call multiple hardware queues. Most of the storage devices do not support multiple hardware queues. Um, so one criteria was that we wanted to improve scaling, make it a lot better, even on devices that didn't support multiple queues. Um, and we wanted to make uh, you know, this uh, block MQ stack or block multi queue stack uh, fully functional, have all the features that device drivers would want, all the features that we would want to, you know, to satisfy um, I.O. from an application. Um, again, implement and debug once. Um, I'll, I'll touch upon what some of these features are that device drivers have or need to use um, in some of the following slides. And finally, we wanted to become this block multi queue to become the queuing model in the storage stack. We didn't want to add a third way of, of accessing devices. Uh, basically, we wanted to rule out the old request of end model, uh, gradually convert everything to run in block MQ. Um, that, I mean, that makes for a leaner code base, easier maintenance, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, just a semantic question. Mm -hmm. People are calling uh, a multi uh, multi capable hardware. Is it hardware which is NCQ capable or is it something else? No. So NCQ is, is the 
the property of being able to handle multiple requests in flight, right? So you can send 10 to the device and it'll do them in the order that it sees most fit and then complete them in the order it wants as well. Multiple, uh, or multiple queues is the fact that you can have one application telling the device to do something while you have another one telling the device to do something and they're not accessing the same registers basically on the device. So these are multiple entry points into the hardware. So usually for a device driver, you have some sort of interface that says, you know, it might be a set of registers or something that says, you know, read and write and uh, to, to hear, and these are the pages we want to do it to and so forth. Um, and you can expose multiple of these interfaces from the hardware to be able to do that. You can, they, it could be. Usually you do multiple queues either for affinity reasons because you want to improve scaling, or you can have multiple queues where you say, all right, priority on this queue is such and such. If you submit here, it's higher maybe, or if you submit here, it's different. So you can use it for resource isolation as well. And if you have enough queues, you can even do both, right? You can have a hierarchy of, of multiple queues and funneling in down into one queue and so forth and do that set up very you know, complex um, scenarios. But for flash devices, basically, why we did, or hardware renders want to do multiple queues was to get rid of this contention, basically. So applications didn't, didn't touch on the same state to be able to do I.O. And on the block storage devices, do you have an example of a device that supports? So the only, uh, the most current device that supports multiple queues is NVMe. Uh, that uh, by design supports up to 64K queues. Uh, so basically you end up having one queue per CPU in the system which means you never have any contention when you try and talk to it. There are a couple of, of uh, SCSI storage adapters that support it as well, uh, but apart from that, basically, you know, nothing, <coughs> nothing supports it yet. It's, it's coming out, and people will do it, but NVMe is the prime example of, of multiple queues these days. So history of block and queue, um, real quick, started in 2011. <laughs> Um, due to various responsibilities and, and uh, work-related items. I didn't spend a lot of time on it in 2011. Um, in 2012, I uh, convinced my uh, then existing company to that uh, we should get an intern that would uh, help me out with uh, writing Black MQ. He ended up writing uh, a big paper about it and presenting in various conferences. Um, so that I think that was very, uh, very successful, a fruitful venture. And uh, finally, we ended up getting it merged in the 313 kernel. And for the initial merge, I think we supported one device driver or something like that. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't fully production ready at this point, but it was important, I think, to get it into the kernel and uh, get more eyes and attention on it and other people helping out getting, uh, getting the missing feature and so forth that developed. So this is the basic architecture of, of Block MQ. Um, this is um, an example where we have six applications running and we have a number of software queues. These are the blue ones. Is this on? Yeah. Um, so each application talks to a software queue, and the number of software queues will funnel into a hardware queue, and which will end up directly in the hardware side. I've got a zoomed picture on the next slide to sort of show this more clearly. Um, so basically, the application has its own private per CPU queue. This is what, in Block MQ, we call software queues. Uh, that means the application can submit I.O. Uh, without having to touch any state from the application running on another CPU in the system. Um, uh, so submission is now fully privatized, and that was you know, one of the important parts. Uh, so we can have application A and B running on CPU A and B, um, doing their own thing and not having to worry about what the other guy's doing. So the software queues map then to a number of hardware queues. Um, so there are always as many software queues as there are CPUs in the system. So when you boot up um, your system and you have eight uh, cores in it, you will have eight uh, software queues on any given block and queue driven device. For hardware queues, it depends. You know, as mentioned, some devices sort support a lot of them. Uh, NVMe supports up to 64K. Um, in, in practice, uh, depending on the device, it could be anywhere from you know, four to eight hardware queues or something like that, and up to you know, much larger. Um, the devices that Intel ship support, uh, I don't know how many they support, enough that you don't uh, run out of them on, on practical systems these days. So we have any sort of, of, of mapping between the software queues to the hardware queues. Um, if we have enough, it'll be a one-to-one -one mapping. Every software queue will map directly down to hardware queue and go directly to hardware. If we don't, um, we end up having to set up uh, some sort of hierarchy of how these map. 
And uh, basically, BlockMQ will factor in the topology of the system. Say you have two hardware queues and you have a two-socket system. Generally, you will have one hardware queue on each of the, of the nodes. If you have more, you might split the sockets into you know, different hardware queues and, and so forth. This is uh, part, some of the functionality that's provided by BlockMQ, that it knows the topology of the system and it will help set up these mappings as efficiently as possible. And finally, at the very bottom, we have the hardware queue that maps directly to the block and queue hardware queue. Uh, there's always a direct mapping between these two, and that handles the actual dispatch to the hardware and the completion events uh, coming in from the system. So some of the, the features of block and queue that were provided, um, I think Yan uh, talked about uh, tagging. I will detail tagging a little more in, in a further slide, um, just to ensure that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, but efficient and fast version of the tagging features that we need. Um, timeout handling, that's another you know, general functionality that every block device needs to provide. Um, if the hardware doesn't respond to a, a specific I.O. within the given time, we need to be able to complete it um, and uh, air it out on the user side. Um, BlockMQ uh, eliminated a lot of the allocations that were inherent in how we used the QIO in the stack. Uh, we'll show a diagram of, of that as well. It provides local completions. Um, local completion means that um, when you submit an I.O. from a given CPU, ideally you want the I.O. to be completed by the device on that specific CPU again in the future. The application has you know, hot data on, or hot cache lines potentially on that CPU, so you want to uh, utilize that fact. Um, it provides the intelligent queue uh, to CPU mappings, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Depending on how many hardware queues you have, it can be a, a drastically different setup of how we map CPUs to hardware queues. And again, we need to use these for, for the IQ affinity mappings as well. So if you have a hardware that does have multiple queues, generally you have a completion IRQ vector assigned to each of these hardware queues. And through the um, APIC in the system, you can tell where you want these IRQ events to happen. So that's another important part of the entire IRF stack is that you tune and tweak these settings so that it all matches up and lines up. Uh, it provides a, a clean API. Um, as a maintainer of the storage stack or something that provides functionality to drivers, generally you want to provide as a feature-rich and easy um, API as you can, um, given that most of the bugs, I think, are in drivers, not in the core code. Um, so the, the easier we can make it to use these APIs and the harder we can make it to misuse, I think <coughs> equally important, uh, the better off we are in general. And I think that became apparent that that was true once we started doing driver conversions from the old model to the new model. When you look at the diff stat, we're usually removing a lot more code than we're adding. Uh, so which is good, you know, the less driver code we have, uh, the, the better, essentially. So if we look at the flow of, of IO and block and queue, it all starts out with an application uh, through the file system, allocating a BIO unit, putting pages into it, and then having to send it to the block layer. Once you get into the block layer, we have to find a free request. That's the request structure I, I talked about previously. Um, if we don't have a free uh, request, if there's a lot of I.O. going on in the system, we have to wait. So we'll go down here and sleep on that resource. Um, and then at some point when something completes, you know, we've woken up and hopefully there will be one. Once we do get a free request, we have to map the, have to map the B.I.O. to the request, insert it into the software queue, and potentially tell the hardware queue to run. Um, so that all depends on what type of I.O. this is and, and a bunch of other conditions. Blocking Q will decide, all right, should we kick off this I.O. now or do we have to wait a little bit? So once the hardware queue runs, uh, that's again blocking queue functionality. It'll take one of the requests off of the list and it'll push it to the device driver and say, you should submit this. The device driver will return some sort of status saying, all right, I submitted it or maybe that was an error. You should, um, you should fail this I.O. Or maybe I was busy, I was running out of resources for some reason on the hardware side and deferred to later. And now we'll essentially keep on running until we hit one of these error conditions that we have to we either run out of requests to do or we run out of resources and we have to wait. Some point in the future we'll get a completion event, usually an IRQ, that'll complete the um, I.O. and it'll free all the resources associated with it. So that means the BIO that was allocated up here will free that and the request um, that was sent uh, that we found initially, we'll mark that as free, and we'll check if somebody else is waiting on resources to wake them up. So that's the basic flow um, through the block MQ stack. If we look at the old stack, there are some similarities and there's some differences. Um, I've attempted to highlight here in red some of the problematic areas. 
Um, again, we started with the BIO unit, and um, the difference in the old stack that we had to go and allocate a request. So if you notice here in block MQ, it says find a free request. Um, for the old stack, we don't have these pre-allocated, so we have to go into the memory allocator and get it. Uh, we can fail doing that, or we cannot. We will go map it to the bio to request again. That's something going to happen in parallel, not an issue. Once we go and insert it into the queue, um, this is one of the points where we run into contention again. And once we get to the point where the driver runs, what happens in the old model is that that was uh, what I would call a pull model. So instead of block and queue where it keeps handing requests to the device driver, for the old model you basically give it uh, just the queue itself and it has to pull, pull stuff off of the queue. Uh, that's another point where we run into contention since we have to lock things up to be able to pull these things off of the queue. Once we do that, we have to go and allocate a tag. That's again a difference from block and queue. Um, so for the old code, we have to allocate a request and we have to allocate a tag. Uh, in block and queue, we tie requests and tags uh, completely together. So once we have a request, we also have the tag. And once we've done that, generally when you go into the driver, you have some sort of, of command associated with the hardware that you have to go and allocate. Um, you have to allocate scatter gathered lists. Uh, these are things that hold information for the DMA engine on where to transfer data. And all these things are provided by Block and Queue in the fashion that once you register a driver with Block and Queue, you tell it how much extra payload data you need per request. So we can stuff all this stuff in behind the request, and so we completely eliminate all these allocations on the Block and Queue side. And similar again, we submit it to hardware, and then we go back and pull stuff off. Once the completion come in, uh, we do the same thing, complete the I.O. in the old stack, um, but instead of just having to free the BIO, we have a bunch of other things we have to free as well. We have to free a request, we have to free the tag, uh, we have to free the hardware commands and, and whatnot. Um, so it's, it's, it's a simpler layout for the, uh, for the new stack and, um, and we have a lot less um, both allocations we have to do and a lot less shared state that we have to touch um, compared to the old stack. So as mentioned, for completions, it's important we get them as locally as possible. Um, generally, the CPU scheduler tends to want to keep applications on the same CPU as long as possible. And that's because you can have you know, hot uh, data in your cache. So moving it or bouncing around between different CPUs in the system is, is generally a really bad idea. Um, when you get a completion event and it's on a drastically different CPU that you're currently running on, we have to use interprocessor interrupts to signal the remote CPU in the system. And these are, uh, can be expensive. Uh, and, or the scheduler could decide that since we're now signaling wake up on a different CPU, that maybe I should migrate the application over here and I'll have it run there instead. So one of the design criteria of Block and Queue is we wanted to provide localized completions to make this as, uh, as efficient as possible. Um, there's so software support that's needed for this, for single queue devices, since you generally only have a single IRQ completion vector on single queue devices. So you have very limited, limited flexibility on where you want to place it. You can do things like saying it's only going to run on this particular node, for instance, and then you keep I.O. intensive applications on that node, and then you reduce some of the cross-node traffic uh, when driving I.O. to it. But that depends on how flexible your system setup is, that you're, if you're able to do that or not. Um, so we wanted to provide some sort of functionality that would be able to uh, to make um, to get the completion events to happen where we we do want them to happen. So basically, what happens in Block MQ is that depending on once we get the RQ completion event for a given request, we can see CPU the application running on CPU B submitting a red IO request goes through the stack. We get a completion event at some point, and then Block MQ checks if the RQ that we're currently, the CPU we're running this uh, IRQ on, if that is correct or not. And if it is, we can directly complete the I.O. If not, we have to use an inner processor uh, interrupt um, to bounce it to another um, CPU in the system. All right, so let's talk about tagging a little bit. Uh, that's been mentioned a couple of times here, I think, in, in passing. Um, but essentially what, what tagging is, it's a unique cookie you assign to a piece of I.O., so when you send it to the hardware, when the hardware completes that I.O., it'll tell you that cookie again, and that means you can find whatever it was on the software side. Um, back in the days when I.O. devices didn't handle multiple I.O.s at the time, when an I.O. completed, you always knew what it was because there's only one current request going on. But once you can have multiple requests in, in, uh, in flight at the time on the device side, 
you, have, you need to have some sort of way to identify this request. So basically, the tag is just a number. Um, it can be, devices can support any number of you know, in-flight operations at the time. If you look at a SATA device, generally it'll support 31 um, pending commands for NCQ. So that means the tag is any value from, you know, from 1 to 32 or 0 to 31. So essentially, when we have to go and um, uh, submit a piece of I.O. to the device, we have to get a unique tag. So we can't submit, you know, use a tag that's already in, in, in flight for obvious reasons. And once the request completes, we have to, uh, to free this particular tag as well. So for tagging support, some of the in, important features that we wanted in blocking queue was that it had to be, you know, fast and efficient. There are cases where uh, when you only have a single queue in the device, for instance, or maybe you have multiple queues, but you end up due to hardware design constraints, you have to share this, you know, space of tags between all the queues in the system. So it was important to make this really scalable. Uh, if you look at block device drivers that implement tagging, generally what they do is, is really simple. Um, they'll allocate a, an array of integers and clear it all to zero. And every time you have to go and get a tag, you'll do a you know, find first zero bit. And uh, when you get that, then you attempt to set it. Uh, if, if it's already set at that point, well, you go through the same process again. Um, so that's sort of the uh, naive approach. And, and uh, that's what all device drivers essentially end up doing. It doesn't scale very well, uh, since when you assign a single bit to a tag, you end up having a lot of shared cache lines between the people that uh, try to acquire these tags, these are applications submitting I.O., and the uh, completion side when you have to go and free these, free these tags again. So we wanted to make that really efficient so that if you're sharing a tag map, it should be fast. Um, another thing that we wanted to be efficient was if you look at the old uh, approach of having uh, when you run out of tags. So for the cases where you flood the device with I.O. and you end up using all the tags in the system, you have to wait on some new tags becoming available. In the classical approach in the Linux kernel, what we do is that we have a, what we call a wait queue. Um, so before you go and get a tag, you add yourself to a wait queue. Uh, if there's no available tags, you go to sleep. And once somebody completes a tag, he'll go and you know, wake up this wait queue, and people waiting for these tags will then get it woken up. Um, so that means you can have a very scalable tagging setup on its own, but the wait queue itself is being locked down. So if you end up running at or near the tag exhaustion all the time, then you end up banging on this, this wait queue a lot, and uh, that reduces your scalability. So Block and Queue uh, attempted to address, I think these are the two primary scaling concerns on tagging, um, basically by attempting to make software uh, queue hinting sticky. Uh, what that means is that um, you have applications that are submitting I.O., we tend to keep them sticky in a, a specific area or region of the tag map or the tag layout. And we spread out the layout a lot more. So instead of having, say, having an integer represent your 32 tags, uh, we sp split them out a little bit. I'll, I'll show a graph on the next page to, to do that. And to solve the, the issue of, of um, bad scaling near um, tag exhaustion, we did implement a feature called rolling wake-ups, where essentially you have uh, multiple wait queues and you round robin between these. So you can have multiple applications sleeping on tags, being woken up in a FIFO-like order still, um, but not having to touch the same wait queues. So for the sparse tag maps, generally um, what would happen for my particular device here, my laptop, you can see up here on, on the right, uh, it supports 31 tags. Uh, so that means that if we do um, the classical approach of doing one bit per tag, a single unsigned integer would su uh, suffice, right? We can have each bit represent a tag. Um, but what Black MQ ends up doing is, so we can see all the way on the right, I hope you guys can read that, it says bits per word equals two. So that means that Black MQ has decided we'll spread these tags out and per word we'll only do two bits. So this is the layout that we end up happening. Instead of just shoving it into a tiny integer at the end, we put two bits in an integer spanning a cache line which is generally 64 bytes on, on um, modern systems these days. And the next two bits are in the next cache line and so forth. So that means we're, we're essentially throwing a, a bit of memory at the scaling issue. Um, instead of having just a, you could, we, we could have used four bytes um, that would have sufficed to support these number of tags. We end up having, um, so how many would that be? Let's say one kilobyte instead. Uh, so it's not a huge concern these days. I mean, if you're using four bytes or one kilobyte, practically free. Um, and the, the benefits are potentially huge. Because when we do run applications, 
when application A comes in and tries to queue, we'll start him off randomly somewhere in this map. Um, so he ends up starting here, for instance, and he's able to allocate tags one and zero here. Let's say he only has two commands pending in flight. Once they complete, right, he'll touch the same cache line again. At the same time as he's doing that, we have other applications that start off, you know, differently randomly in this map, and they stick to it as well. So as long as, as long as we can spread this out and we don't have more applications, then we have you know, sort of portions of the tag space, we can run these completely in parallel and uh, not suffer any sort of scaling concerns. And so we can see for this specific example, bits per word is two. So that's an, an, um, an artifact of how many CPUs are in the system and how many tags you support. Some devices, the tag space is so huge that it doesn't really matter, right? We can still do individual, we you know, fill it out, not do a sparse layout. As long as we ensure that the applications are running different spaces in the tag map, we don't really care. So this particular case is just specific to the system. Yes. Right. So the question is, if you use more than two tags, you'll wander around, and that's true. Um, uh, if you if application A tries to submit I/O and it doesn't have a valid hint already, it'll end up in a random place. Or if it does have a, a valid hint, it'll go and search that space first, and if it's not, it'll jump to a new place. Um, so in practice, this is shown to solve the issue. Uh, we haven't seen any scalability concerns with this approach. Um, even though it is somewhat of a heuristic. All right, so now we talked a bit about what BlockMQ looked like and uh, uh, the new uh, tagging feature for BlockMQ. Um, so now we can attempt to rerun the test case that we did originally. So basically the exact same thing we're running. The only difference here now is we're telling no block that we want to run Q mode equals two, which means that the BlockMQ way of attaching and for this particular case, we're simulating we have 32 submission queues. Um, so for the system we're running on, that's basically, excuse me, one hardware queue um, per CPU in the system. So ideal case, so to speak. And this is what we end up seeing. Uh, so we see our initial, our initial performance uh, originally was around 260K. Here we're much higher, about 360K IOPS. But the important case is though, as we go and add threads in the system, we see essentially almost a linear uh, uh, scaling or doubling each time we double the number of threads. Uh, if you do the actual math um, for the eight threads doing 2.4 million IOPS, that's a scaling factor of seven, where ideally we'd love to see eight. Um, so there's still obviously some little scaling concerns. We don't see completely linear scaling, but for most cases we do. If we look at the case of seven threads, we're actually 95% linear scaling, which is you know pretty much as good as I think it's going, as it's going to be. If we graph the two operations uh, side to side, uh, it becomes even more depressing to look at the old stack, uh, completely flat, whereas the new one will reach for the sky. So if you look at the profiles again, at the top we have the old profile from the single queue um, mode again. Uh, the thing to note here as well, as I did mention in the previous slide, uh, completion times generally we see we're, we're 10x higher um, running in single, the old request mode as compared to the new mode. And the 50th percentile latency is 24 microseconds, which compares to about three microseconds on the block and queue side. So again, a, a 10x reduction in uh, latency for this particular case. If you look at the profiles for, for block and queue. This is for the eight thread case, so the, the very top one. Uh, we, we start to get a good idea of why we don't see linear scaling. Um, the very top do block dev direct IO is now part of the, um, the trace. We can see it in the original trace as well. It, it was uh, burning about 0.76% of the time. Now we're burning 7% of the time. This is a classical thing that happens when you start rewriting stuff to make them scale. Um, when you look at the original profile, all you see is the locking in the old stack. Um, so you go and fix that, and then something new comes up. Uh, granted, you know, uh, performance has drastically increased, uh, but we still have, you know, something going on there. And in fact, what is going on, and we can see, um, so parts of this, so 4% is FIO at doing a new IO. That's something that needs to be written in FIO. But this is actually the culprit right here, um, the inode IO done. And that's part of, of the uh, direct IO code in the kernel that will, when you do direct IO to an inode, it'll increment a count, 
And once you complete that I.O., it'll decrement this count as well. So that's an example of having shared state between um, both, you know, everybody talking to that particular I.O. doing direct I.O. and completing I.O. And the reason why um, direct I.O. does this is that if you do direct I.O. to a regular file in a file system, you want to prevent that from racing with somebody doing truncate and making the file smaller. Uh, but as if you might remember, we're running file on a block device, so that means the I.O. is a block device. So we don't really have to care about truncating in this particular case. So we can solve this particular scaling issue very uh, simply by just saying, don't do this increment and decrement on an inode that doesn't need it um, because it's, it's pointless. If you do that, you actually do get linear scaling up to eight threads. Um, so I, I didn't provide that here. So at this point you might ask, that's all you know, well and good. You had 32 hardware queues on your particular test case. Um, but what about the single queue performance on block MQ, since all devices almost these days are single queue? So that's a really good question. So I decided to rerun the test again. So exact same test case, no block. Um, but instead of, of just doing 32 queues with one per CPU in the system, that's the yellow line we have here on the top, the orange line. Uh, I did one with two queues. That's the red line. And I did one with a single hardware queue. So that means this is the old case of the green line here. We have the blue line using a single queue. And we see our single thread performance is as good or maybe even better than the full multi-queue approach. And while we don't see linear scaling, we do at least see that once you start throwing um, more horsepower at the issue, you do increase performance. Uh, especially apparent all the way at the end where you know, we're remaining flat on 300K or something like that IOPS on, on the old stack. And we're able to reach roughly 1.2 million IOPS on uh, block and queue running with just a single queue. So for this case, um, the reason why we get almost linear scaling with two queues already is that if you remember the previous slide, the test system I was on was a two socket system. So we have two nodes. So by just having basically a hardware queue on each of these nodes, we eliminate a huge part of the cross node traffic. Once we have just a single queue, uh, we do see a drastic hit as we start adding um, threads on the node. And that's even apparent when you look at where these two, the orange and red line go. So for two threads, we see exactly the same performance still for one thread, because we're talking to two hardware queues. Once we start exceeding and sharing the hardware queues between um, applications or CPUs, we start to see a widening gap of the performance in the system. So that means at this point, we said, all right, block and queue. Yes. Mm-hmm. So the question is, if you get the same or good performance on a single yes, queue with block mounts like you. Yeah. All right, so the question is, if I understand correctly, on a single queue device, on block and queue, if you pin it to a single CPU, will you get good performance? Mm -hmm. So multiple of these single queue devices on multiple CPUs. Yeah, you will get, I mean, there's some cases where um, if you run a device really hard, since we do the completions locally on the same CPU that submitted them, at some point you're gonna run out of horsepower, right? So if you exceed the CPU resources you have to drive IOPS on a single CPU, then at some point you're gonna to have to add you know, more cores to the situation. And if you do have a single queue device, then you will not see the linear scaling. Um, so this depends on how, say if you're doing 400,000 IOPS on a single CPU, you're doing a lot of completions, right? A lot of IRQs. So you may be spending 40% of your time just running completions, 
that leaves you know 60% of the time to actually drive the device. So there's going to be some limit where, all right, say I can do an X amount of IOPS on a single core in the system, depending on how that fast that core is. If you want to go higher than that, you have to start you know, utilizing multiple cores to drive it. Or saying, all right, maybe I run the completions on this CPU. It's not ideal from latency concerns, but it means I have 100% of that CPU for completions and at least 100% of this guy to do submissions. So there are cases where it makes sense to keep things really affinitized. There are cases where you sort of have to spread them out. And again, there are cases where um, system administrators saying, you know, that's just not flexible. We can't, we can't deal with that situation, right? We have to be able to, if you have a situation where the difference between a finely tuned system and uh, out of the box uh, system, you know, is 5X, then people start yelling at you a whole lot because it just, it's a very inflexible and very rigid setup you end up having to do to drive the performance of the system. All right, so now we were able to lean back, you know, have a beer and celebrate, uh, problem solve, we're done, uh, nothing more to do. Um, but then all the SCSI folks started yelling and saying, you know, performance really sucks in SCSI. And that was true. So SCSI is layered on top of the old IO stack. It doesn't use bypass mode. And on top of that, SCSI has its own. I mean, it's, it suffered through the same things as the block stack in that we had to deal with really slow devices. So we did a lot of things that didn't really, really matter on these slow devices, CPU-wise. But once we were doing a lot of IOPS, uh, it started, you know, really uh, sucking a whole lot. So that means SCSI MQ started to get into the picture. Uh, basically, what SCSI MQ is, it's a new queuing model for SCSI that instead of being layered on top of, of uh, the old request defend, it's now laid on top of, of blocking queue. And this was initially started by uh, Nick Bellinger at the Terra. Um, I think it's a proof of concept and he showed really good scaling. It was later continued and picked up by Christoph, um, who pulled it to completion. And uh, in the result, that was merged in 3.17. There's a K config option. You can set in your kernel now. It says config SCSI MQ default, which means that SCSI MQ will be the default for any device in the system. Or there's a boot parameter you can use, SCSI mod, use block MQ equals zero. If you do that, it'll enable block MQ on the device. Um, the SCSI MQ work was useful for block MQ itself in, in various ways. Um, it helped drive some of the features that we needed. Uh, when I developed block MQ, I provided all the features for the device drivers that we had in the system that we converted. Um, but SCSI MQ had a couple of, of cases um, where it, it needed a, a richer feature set, so to speak. Um, so that was uh, really useful, and Christoph ended up contributing a lot to Block MQ and expanding it. Um, so SCSI MQ ends up utilizing basically all of the features of, of, of Block MQ. That means for each of the requests you have in the system, it's able to attach um, the hardware command and the SG list and whatnot. So reducing the number of allocations per I.O. down from uh, you know, five down to one with Block MQ. Um, support for partial completions was added. So that's when usually when a device completes an I.O., it says, I'm completely done with I.O., you know, can do with it what you want. Here's the status. Um, for SCSI and for SCSI low-level drivers, we need support for saying, I completed you know, parts of the request, and then you'll go and complete it, and you'll reissue it again. Um, support for bidirectional commands was also added through SCSI MQ. That's the SCSI oddity or weirdness where uh, commands can be both a read and write at the same time. So a command will both uh, read and write data. And support for shared tag space. For um, SCSI adapters, generally, the tagging is an artifact of the host bus adapter. So that means the host bus adapter will have a large tagging space, and all the devices hanging off of it um, share that tag space. So that was another area where we needed to have really fast support for tagging, and uh, shared tagging in particular. I'm not going to talk too much about SCSI MQ, but I'll show a, a, a quick graph of performance. Um, so this is different than my test case, where I added threads to the system. For SCSI MQ, they just added LUNs. So basically each one, each LUN is a device in the system. And the uh, interesting distinction here is that each of these will be a separate block device, right? That's how it works, a uh, separate SCSI device too. So that means all these are actually separate queues. Um, so this is a much easier test case. Once you're accessing two LUNs at the time, you're expecting you should double performance. Um, but what we ended up seeing in 2632 was that performance, you see a rough doubling on two LUNs, but then you quickly just drop off as compared to where you want to see the scaling um, end up being. And um, a recent result with a 317 RC3 um, back when SCSI MQ was merged. For the same test case, we see completely linear scaling up until we reach 1 million IOPS, which as it so happens, end up being um, the limitation of the hardware in, in this particular system. So I think that was, a, um, even for a much easier test case, I think both demonstrates how poorly SCSI was performing before with fast devices 
And also, um, a really nice linear scaling we end up seeing with uh, SCSI MQ. So SCSI MQ will be the default at some point. I think Christoph has the same idea if he wants to rip out the old, um, old um, queuing model in SCSI, get rid of the kconfig option and boot option and so forth. There's some features missing to make that um, feasible right now, um, and the most important one being an IO scheduler. Uh, so just a, a quick um, roundup of, of uh, running block MQ and SCSI MQ at Facebook. Basically, uh, initially when we started doing this, we were running a 310 kernel inside of Facebook. Um, that's still the predominant uh, kernel, although we're now upgrading to a newer 4X kernel. Uh, so I backported everything to 310, all block MQ, all of SCSI MQ, very painful. Uh, but it was, it was worth it. Um, I ran some testing with it, and once I was happy, I went around lobbying into the, some of the different tiers of Facebook saying, um, if you guys are I.O. intensive, you should really try this out. It'd be interesting to see. So we ran a couple pilots on uh, pr uh, particularly cache infrastructure and Tau. Tau is uh, the fa Facebook um, uh, backing store for what we call the social graph. So basically any interaction you have with people and you, you know, like stuff and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, they're pretty I.O. intensive. And uh, they were so happy with the results and the latency wins that we saw uh, that they immediately switched it on in production. So that was a, a nice, a good win. The biggest wins we saw on the Facebook front was on latency reductions. Uh, Facebook isn't super intensive on IOPS, I think I can say. Um, I think lots of, given that the storage stack didn't scale, lots of, I think, intelligent application writers ended up having to rewrite some of their, how they do I.O. to devices, uh, not do a small I.O. as they potentially would have liked to do, but batch things up and whatnot, so we are... Um, reduce some of this per I.O. overhead. Um, so that means that we didn't, I mean, while we're not driving, you know, in the millions of IOPS for each of the devices, we're still driving high enough I.O. rates that some of the optimizations in block and SCSI and Q make a big difference. And outside of that, we saw a good system percentage usage wins as well, a good reduction in system time. And when you're running, um, you know, a number of machines that uh, Facebook are, um, getting uh, a reduction even in a couple of percent of system time you know, translate to a, a lot of, of safe money and, and power and so forth. So here's a graph of, of the test case that I ran. Basically, we set aside um, two classes of, or one class of system and uh, took a pool of, of 10 machines and split them up into five. So they're running identical workloads. And uh, so the red would be the ones that are running or will be running SCSI MQ, and the blue are, are um, the ones that will just reboot into the same kernel but not enable SCSI MQ. And we can see before we, uh, we do flip the switch and reboot them, they're tracking fairly closely. This is the latency and this is the time as it progresses. Uh, due to various uh, reasons, I can't put uh, numbers on these graphs. But suffice to say, they start at zero, so there's no you know, cheating going on. And we see once we start to reboot things and actually turn on SCSIMQ, for the, the class or the, the group of machines that are running SCSIMQ, we started seeing a nice flattening latency graph for requests. Whereas we still see the continuing trends of the non scuzz MQ having much, uh, you know, much worse latency profile. If we zoom in on that a little bit, um, it becomes even more apparent that for the old approach, uh, we're essentially seeing twice the latencies as we do with the new one. And not only that, I mean, it's much more erratic in the old, um, on the old stack. And for production people, I mean, ideally you want to see a flat graph. It makes provisioning a lot easier. You know exactly what sort of latencies you're going to get. Anything that sort of runs from your 1x to 2x in latencies all the time, depending on what the load of the system is, uh, is just not performing really well. All right, I'm not going to talk. I think I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk about this. But essentially, that list is the drivers we've already converted. The takeout from that is that it spans from really fast devices, like the Micron SSD or NVMe driver, and all the way down to the loop device, device driver in the current kernel that's running block MQ or the UBI MMC uh, block storage, which is really you know, slow storage, and SCSI MQ as well. So we've got conversions all over the map. Um, block MQ is not just for really fast, scalable um, devices. Uh, I think it's starting to prove its design as being useful for basically any sort of device in the system. And uh, finally, a bit of future work, IO scheduler that was mentioned. I think uh, Jan said didn't have an IO scheduler. It's completely true. Uh, we do mostly FIFO behavior in block MQ, uh, fairly close to. And for some setups, that's a, that's a concern. That's an issue. So we're going to have to do something about that. Um, work is in progress to do a deadline a proportional share type scheduler. Um, it's progressing a little slowly, but hopefully that'll, that'll um, happen sooner rather than later.
And the only other thing I'll mention here is I.O. polling is becoming interesting. So for the next class of devices, I mean, we thought Flash was fast, but we're in for another you know, treat in the form of, of a 3D crosspoint and other things that Intel and, and other manufacturers are introducing. We're going to see even lower latencies, uh, latencies that are low enough to the point where um, we can't afford to wait on our Q events anymore. Um, I've done some experimentation on devices, I've been able to reduce latencies on actual hardware down from um, 8 microseconds into the 3 and 4 microsecond range with doing some, um, some polling instead of, of having RQ driven completions. So that's something we might even see in the 4.4 kernel, uh, so coming up I think fairly shortly. In general, more conversions. Uh, we still have the long-term goal of, of making BlockMQ the, the general, general I.O. infrastructure in the kernel and um, killing off the old stack. And with that, I'll take some questions, if there are any. Yes. Oh, a lot. I mean, there's the old floppy driver, for instance. I mean, nobody's really wanting to touch that. Um, so I, I think, I don't have a specific number, but there's definitely, once we do SCSI, that takes care of a whole slew of class of devices. That's the big one. And we've done loop. Uh, there are things like uh, NBD and, and whatnot. Uh, but there's been, you know, over the last 10 years, been a migration, I think, of, of classic block device drivers into the SCSI infrastructure because it makes it easier for them to do things and because it's a, a feature-rich environment. Um, so I don't know. There's definitely going to be a very long tail of things like the floppy driver that I don't know even know what we're going to do about it. I mean, who has floppy these days? So. In the end, you showed a pretty class, and then you zoomed in on the right hand side. So that was before it was rebooted. Huh? So that was before it was rebooted. Okay. So the left hand, the last one was assumed in one, and that was all flat, I think, on the SCSI MQ side. The previous one was basically just showing that the two groups of machines, before we flipped the switch, were doing identical workloads, and the latency profiles were, you know, consistent with each other. And what I didn't show, and I could have showed, was that we, I get a number of requests per second, that sort of thing, on, you know, the, the, um, on the tower infrastructure. But it was, it was so close that it'd just be boring to show. So we're basically having just a better latency profile with the same workload. So uh, one thing I thought was interesting was how the queues are actually split into two levels. You have software queues and you have software queues. Right. Right. No, that was that was exactly the reason. So if we do one software cube with CPU, you know that an application is ever going to be spanning CPUs or things like that, then you keep that completely private. And you're also right, I think you're alluding to the fact that there's, if you have multiple software queues sharing one block MQ hardware queue, there's going to be, there is a lot of time and experimentation done on uh, having, I think, a clever approach of knowing which software queues at pending I.O. so we didn't have to, when you funnel down like that, have to touch a lot of the shared state in between. Basically, per hardware queue, you have a bitmap maintained of which software queues are potentially having uh, I.O. requests, and then you can round robin between these and, and take them in. Um, but that was a little more too much detail to put on it. But in general, I mean, if guys are interested in the code, it's in the block subdirectory of the kernel, and all the files are basically block-mq something. And it's not a whole lot. I think the entire block MQ infrastructure is something like 5,000 lines of code. Um, so it's not like it's a huge elaborate thing. Um, it should be fairly, I think, easy to understand. Especially, I think, with some of the slides here that sort of give you a general of how the data structures tie together, then it should be uh, pretty trivial. Yes? So the question is, you know, can we do more IOPS if we push things into the uh, user layer instead? Um, generally, I've, I've, I've never been a fan of the approach of let's, you know, pull the networking stack and stuff into user space. 
I, I sort of compare it to the uh, you know good old if you're cold you'll wet your pants. You know it's it's um, temporary relief, nice and warm, but uh, in the long run it's just a really bad solution to the problem. I think maintenance-wise and so forth. But yeah, I mean you could obviously if you drive the hardware directive in user space, there will be um, huge advantage on latency concerns, right? You can much easier do polling and things like that. But I think this is, these are mostly relegated to very niche type situations. I mean, if you're extremely latency sensitive, doing high frequency trading or things like that, I think for those cases you can afford to throw, because you need to throw a lot of money at the problem, not just developing the solution, but you know, maintaining it over time. Um, so if you can afford to do that and you want to do that, uh, certainly, but I think it's, it's a huge undertaking, um, both initially and in the long run. So with polling, we're trying to provide some of these features and uh, reducing um, reducing the overhead of, of per I.O. So instead of going into the kernel and going to sleep and waiting and stuff, you basically go all the way in right, and spin out and wait on it. So apart from having a kernel user transition, which is not expensive, you're essentially getting most of the benefit of taking all that code and, and putting it in, in, into your application or into sort of some sort of library. And you're getting all the nice resource management on the kernel front. So, so I think you have to have really good reasons to do it. <coughs> Yeah, so I think once we do an I.O. scheduler, we can do it. Uh, that's what we're waiting on. Um, I am working with a fellow from um, university in Italy that we're trying to uh, contract to do some of the work. Um, I've, I've done a proof of concept uh, deadline scheduler for MQ. It's actually sitting in my Git repo. But it, hasn't, it really needs somebody to take it to the next step, and I, don't, I haven't had a lot of time to do it. But I think once we have an I.O. scheduler, it'll be easy enough to say, all right, we're just gonna turn it on. Another thing that we've been, I've been playing with internally at Facebook, since I just wanna turn it on by default, is um, having a way of saying, if your device is rotational, use GUSIMQ, because we don't care about IO scheduling as much, uh, or if it's not rotational, sorry, if it's flash, but if you're driving classical disk drives, um, then use the old stack, because you don't really care. That doesn't get rid of the maintenance problem of having the two stacks, but it at least makes uh, I think for a saner default of saying, if your device is fast, write SCSIMQ. If your device is slow, and these IO scheduling, we'll use the, the old approach. The only problem with doing that is once you get to the point where you know the device is rotational or not, you've already set up the entire stack. So I'm working on an approach where you can, we can convert that on the fly, because the alternative would be to, all right, tear things down and then build it up again, the new stack. So I think some, I think that would make for a saner default and uh, probably be a quicker solution than the IO scheduler. All right, thank you.